Thank you, that's right. I'm Fiona Wood. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. And for the last 30 years, I've spent my whole professional life focused on and trying to treat people with burn injuries. I think as a plastic surgeon, I see suffering on a daily basis. I see people's lives who have changed in an instant. And when I look back and sort of introspect, I guess, over those 30 years, where did I start? Where did I start to think that we could do better? And I trace that back to seeing a young child, a young child in 1985. A cup of coffee had gone down the front of that chest. There'd been a period of time of painful dressings, the cries that will probably never leave the mother and father, all those weeks for healing. And I was working in a plastic surgery center in the south of England at the time. And this child turned up to our plastic surgery center the burns are healed now. He needs plastic surgery. It hit me straight between the eyes that this boy would never move properly again. He would never move his neck or his arm. That the scars that had been left from a very simple situation will be with him for life. And so as I moved forward through my education and my training as a surgeon, I became increasingly focused on how to make sure that the quality of the outcome was worth the pain of survival. Many of you may have burnt yourself on the iron, just done a bit of a splash of oil when it's cooking. Just spare one second, a fraction of a second, for half your body being burnt. Ten years ago, uh, this month was a very tra a tra a tragedy that touched many people across the world, but in particular touched Australia. It was the Bali bombings. It was the 10-year review when I was talking to one of those young men, the, football, the captain of the football team, who found himself in that nightclub that night. And he described how he fell into the flames. He broke his back, he lost all his teeth, he had multiple fractures, and 70% of his body was burnt. He went on to survive, and he described on this occasion two weeks ago the pain of that, that injury. But he also went on to describe the pain of the healing week in, week out, and the recovery, the rehabilitation, and making sure that when he first left and he couldn't clean his teeth or brush his hair, how he drove over that first three, four years to the point where he had a full range of movement. The scars will never leave him. So as a surgeon, when I say I've come to talk to you today about how can we do it better, you know, it's, it's what we live, what we breathe on a daily basis. We see suffering, we see lives changed in an instant, and it can happen to anyone. So, what do we do? When someone has a burn wound, the skin, I could talk, to, talk about skin forever. It's a fascinating organ that's well and truly underrated. You know, we, what a beautiful thing is skin. It helps to keep your body in. You know, so, you know, amazing. It does all sorts of things. It's your interface to the world. We look at, this, we look at a baby and we smell that baby and the smell that skin and think, the, you know, how exquisite it is. How can we get back to that when it's damaged? And it takes very little. Our skin is turning over all the time. It takes very little to overwhelm that capacity. And so it can't repair itself. It can't return to the functions of Temperature control, bacterial control, etc. So many functions I couldn't even begin in 18 minutes to talk about. So how, what do we do then? I look around and take your blinkers off. I think anybody in science these days has got to seriously have their blinkers off. They've got to look and see where else they can find information. And certainly in, in embryology and in biological sciences and genetics, we can see all sorts of things happening. I can see a gecko can grow a tail, yet I can't repair a wound without scarring. You know, we may step back from this and think, well, what is it that we do? So I'd like to take you through the last 20 years of work in the area of skin grafting. When you treat somebody with burns, it's a massive juggling exercise. We have the pain. We, ha we still have infection as the biggest killer. We have to seal the skin over as the waves of infection relentlessly come and weaken that body, weaken it, weaken it, weaken the ability of the bone marrow to respond. And we try to seal that surface. So once we've got that surface sealed, we're safe. 
and then we can, and then, but it's, the healing goes on, as I've described. But it gives us an opportunity for life. We can seal that surface, we, get, we are safe, and we can have that opportunity to live again, to then rebuild the skin underneath. So how do we create that surface? If 50% of your body surface is gone, there's only 50% to get skin from. And so traditionally, many years ago, the first, skin, the first skin graft done was in the 1800s. That's a seriously long time ago. And so tradition, when I started about 30 years ago, we would take the surface of the skin, just skim that surface with a very large tool, a very sharp knife, and still skim that surface so we've got a split thickness skin graft. We can change that split thickness skin graft to mesh it and make it larger, so that if I take a, plate, a piece from a leg, I can cover maybe two-thirds of an arm, maybe just less, by meshing it out. But that scar then looks like a mesh. So how, when we get bigger and bigger burns, we're in a situation where technology is advancing, we know that people can survive major burns. I recently had coffee with a patient I met in 1991, the 1st of October 1991, as I'd not long been director of the burn service in Western Australia. He had 92% body surface area burns, and I was expected to walk away. And I said, we don't walk away because we have now the technology to move forward to ensure his survival. And 20 years later, I was having coffee with him. So how did we achieve that? When only 8% of his body left, where could we get the skin from? Well, clearly we can't. So many years ago, in that famous institution in Boston, the MIT, and they, and they started growing skin cells. Because we are, we're into sheets, we're into skin grafts, we, we understand how the blood vessels can come into that sheet and establish its connection with the surface. We can change the skin from here to here. We understand that. So we grew scale, skin cells into sheets. By the time these skin cells were 10 cells thick, they knew which way was up and which way was down. 10 cells thick, you can imagine, that's quite challenging. But certainly, back in 1992, in that stage, there was one place in Australia that was growing skin. There was one other place in the world that was growing skin commercially, and that was Boston. And so we sent a piece of skin from, I live in the west of, uh, Western Australia, uh, Australia, in Western Australia. And we sent that skin overnight to Melbourne. They grew it into sheets. They came back. Their sheets, and we put these sheets on, and we got an element of, of cure. We got an element of closure. We were able to save a life. But that skin was over in that laboratory for three weeks. Every day in a burns unit is a day too long. How could we stop that? How could we shorten that three weeks? So that's where my story started, engaging the whole concept of tissue engineering, tissue expansion. Myself and Marie Stoner, the scientist I worked with, went to raise money and we started our own laboratory. If you heal a burn wound in 10 days, you've got a 4% risk of scarring. If you heal a burn wound in 21 days, 78% will have scarring. Why wait three weeks? Time matters. People die waiting. And so we started in the skin lab in 93, and our first sheets we grew in 10 days. But before long, we realized by, by observation, by taking basic science to the bedside, we saw that the more immature those skin cells were, paradoxically, the better they did. And so we started doing experiments around this, trying to understand what was going on. And then we started seeing that if we take the cells for five days in the laboratory and remove them from the, the flask into a soup, that they did even better. And we, I, my, the operating theaters we work in are around about 34 degrees. That's C. <laughs> and because if a patient gets cold, they no longer clot their blood and so we can't operate. And so I came out of the sweat box, and I walked into the lab to see Marie with the beautiful air conditioning lab, and it was all clean. And in the operating room, we debride, we remove uh, the burnt tissue until such point that we get pinpoint bleeding, and then we know it's alive, somewhat less than subtle. But our, our advances in that area are another 18 minutes at another time. And so there we were, and shook my head, and I said, whoa, we just should just spray this stuff on the time taken to make sure those cells were on the right way up, fixing each patch onto the body so that they didn't shear and move, 
taken it from there, put in a soup on, tried to keep the soup under the dressings. And so at that stage, again, a whole raft of more experiments to do. How can we actually deliver cells to the surface of this burn wound such that they are alive and functional? And so we took, I became, uh, I guess, my amateur physicist, looking at, ver at the vortexing and apertures in various nozzles. And we found a nozzle in a, in a chemist shop in Perth that was from an Italian mouth freshener. And when you put that nozzle on a 5 mil standard hospital syringe, the cells coming through that system with no dead space were viable. 90% plus of, the, of those cells were viable. It was a eureka moment. In the, in the program, you'll see fine, fine dots behind my name. Just off screen is the syringe as we're spraying those cells on. So what we do, we take the skin cells from you to you. It avoids all the issues of rejection. It allows tissue expansion. Each little cell can cover much greater area than when we coalesce them into a sheet and then grow them. And the next step in, step in the whole process was to look back and say, well, we can do this in five days. But five days is a long time. I've said already, one day in the Burns unit is a day too long. How can we actually move quicker? We noticed that our smaller burns by this stage, we were looking at this technology in our smaller wounds. How, where we were still doing our traditional skin grafting, they had scars that were worse than the larger burns where we were doing more advanced technology, where we were mixing the technologies, where we were using the traditional and the cell spray. And so we then moved to say, well, how can we do it in less than five days? So we took the, the absolute key essential components of the laboratory, we miniaturized them. We put them in a box, a box just this big. The box that heats the enzyme up to the required temperature, such that the skin that we harvest, we take a split thickness skin graft, a small postage stamp. We put that in the enzyme. It takes few, a matter of minutes, 10 to 15, 20 if the skin's a little thick. And we take that out, it's like a bread and butter sandwich. And we can peel those slices of the skin apart like we peel the, the, the sandwich apart and the butter is all those actively growing cells. Those cells under normal conditions that will keep us whole, that will keep replenishing the surface against the knocks and, and scrapes of our everyday life. We harvest those cells, filter them through, make them into suspension and deliver them to the wound. That whole process now takes 30 minutes. So, I'm a great believer in learning from today's experience to make tomorrow a the better place. That tomorrow, every morning you get up, is the start of a new journey. So where to now? Where to when we stand back and look at 20 years of our work and work out where to next? I had this, uh, this idea that when I was chasing Scarlet's healing, having seen that boy in 1985, I would get to the top of the mountain, 20 years, oh, no trouble. We plant the fag on that top of the mountain, but it, my goodness, I was wrong. Because as we've changed the goalposts, people survive more and more and more massive injuries. And we're chasing that elusive goal for more complex situations. And so I put it to you, yes, we've got the cells in the right place. But where to next? What create, what self-organizing systems make me this shape? You know, I'm recognizable through life, a little bit big, a little bit smaller, but essentially recognizable through life, from that embryo to death. What self-organizes the systems? Well, we started looking. And started under, we understand that if you're burnt here, the nerve density in the nerves of the scar and the non-scarred matched area are the same they're both decreased. I know that if you have a burn in your right upper limb, the patterning on your left brain has changed. So where to next? We've got the cells in place. We've got the architectural frameworks, as I work with my colleagues in nanotechnology, looking at self-assembly uh, frameworks, such that the cells can express themselves for an appropriate phenotype, such that not only can we seal the surface giving life, but that we can develop the under, under layers of the skin, which give the quality of life. But then we can organize. We can self-organize back to the original shape. 
And is the three-dimensional spatial information for that original shape actually housed in the homunculus in the brain? And I know also from personal experience when I was being scanned a day after I had a tooth out, that the pain blunts and changes that neuroplasticity such that the pattern is lost temporarily. So how can we, with visualization, with active stimulation, think ourselves whole? We put the cells in place, the framework in place, but there are so many things we need to do. But that's in 18 minutes in the future. Thank you very much indeed.